includes gutting the country's government, setting up a new one, and blocking current leaders from holding office again. That's according to the U.S. ambassador to the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. He said this while speaking before their permanent council today. Michael Basarki, a former spokesperson for the OSCE, joins me now. Michael, Russian forces have already pushed out elected officials in Kherson, replacing them with their own. There had been talk of having a referendum of sorts there. Does this change how the U.S. should view the war? Well, absolutely, but it shouldn't surprise them, Anderson, because, you know, that's what the Russian-backed uh, thugs have been doing in Donetsk and Luhansk for the past eight years. I mean, I remember when I was with the, in, with the OSCE and they were just coming into that part of Ukraine, the first thing they did is replaced Ukrainian media with Russian media, introduced the ruble, forced passports onto people, changed the curriculum, destroyed any sign of Ukrainian culture. So it's really, really sad to see this being duplicated, almost a cookie cutter approach elsewhere in Ukraine. Something like 200 Ukrainian cultural sites have already been destroyed or heavily damaged by the Russian side. So not only is the, phys the, the human toll happening, but also very, very much on the cultural and political side too. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres told me yesterday that he said the war will not end in meetings. The war will end when the Russian Federation decides to end it. I'm wondering what you, you make of, of his comments. It, it certainly doesn't bode well for yeah, any was, kind of negotiated settlement. Right. Yeah, it was interesting. He said that, um, you know, I've argued and seen an opinion and elsewhere that the worst thing that could happen is for talks to stop, for diplomacy to stop. But, you know, that trip uh, Secretary Guterres took to Moscow was very, very politically risky for him. And uh, sadly, I don't think much came out of it, even if he did get any sort of assurances from the Russian side. They've proven in the past 60 some days that they don't adhere to their agreements. And indeed, we found that also, you know, with the Russian backed rebels in Donetsk as well. So hopefully he will get some kind of um, concession from the Russian side, especially there in Mariupol, where, as you pointed out earlier, the whole human toll is really, really huge. In a conflict like this, you really see the limitations of the United Nations. I mean, Russia's on the Security Council. They have a veto power over anything the Security Council decides to do. It's sad to see. I mean, uh, from the beginning of the conflict, the United Nations has looked as very toothless. And in fact, you know, they're the ones that were formed. They have the mandate to stop this kind of conflict from happening. And, you know, uh, I'm a former spokesperson for UNICEF, I have a very much insider type of view of the w view of the way things have gone. And at the beginning of the conflict, even the UN top officials did not believe that the Russians would invade. Hence, there was none of that pre-positioning of personnel and supplies done that one would normally do when something like this is expected. And that's why I think the UN was a bit on the back foot when this whole conflict happening. Very, very difficult now, Anderson, of course, to ramp things up because of the way the conflict is playing out difficult supply chains, that sort of thing. The British Defense Minister, Ben Wallace, has said that, that with Putin's invasion, it's not going as planned. He, he may just accept his losses and instead hold on to areas he's gained. Wallace said that Putin could become a, a cancerous growth in Ukraine. How does one fight a cancerous growth? Yeah, well, um, very uh, concerning words. And I think again, going back to what's happened in Donetsk and Luhansk in the past eight years, is that's what the rebels have done, of course, with Russian support, is really dug in. And I think what we're going to see going forward is them holding on to the areas they have right now, but also ratcheting up the conflict or ratcheting it down as it suits their needs. And for example, that missile strike uh, today in, in Kiev, that alleged missile strike, well, uh, that was, I think, uh, an, uh, an example of where things are going to go henceforth. That's why I've l argued for the longest time that the West has to also give the Ukrainians the ability to close the skies technologically and with weaponry. Otherwise, those missiles will continue to come to places like Kiev and perhaps even here to Lviv and elsewhere. So it's, it's a very complex situation at the moment. Yeah, Michael Bolster-Q, I appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much.